there, and welcome to Ancestral Recall. I'm your host, Eli Kaplan. Ancestral Recall is a magic web series that examines the history of Magic the Gathering, set by set, pointing out the cards that mattered in standard, limited, and other formats. I also like to highlight cool cards for EDH and Cube, so you can dust off the cool cards of the past and let you try them out today. Today, we're looking at the closing set of Kamigawa Block, 2005's Saviors of Kamigawa. Designed by Brian Tinsman, this set adds a few new twists on the ongoing war between the Kami and the living residents of the plain. In this show, we're going to look at the story, the mechanics, and the cycles. So, let's get to it! Story! This is the final conclusion to the conflict between spirits and fleshly beings. Okagachi, the most powerful of all spirits, has cornered Emperor Konda, Lord of Eganjo while Michiko Konda finds out that her soul is infused with half the soul of Okagachi's daughter. The other half of the daughter's spirits has been ensconced in that which was taken. When Michiko gets her hands on the MacGuffin, despite her father condemning her to death in madness, she unlocks the Great Essence and ascends to godhood, supplanting both her father and Okagachi as she merges with the material of that which was taken. The conflict is ended, and the giant spirits retreat. Most of the humanoid societies have been destroyed or just overturned, but with a return to harmony, the future of Kamigawa looks bright. Ogre Lord Hidetsugu ascends to become the most powerful demon of the plane, the new Demon Lord of Chaos, or at least on Kamigawa the most powerful demon, while the Myojin of Knight's Reach rewards Toshiro Umezawa by blinding him and banishing him to another plane, where he becomes a minion of Elder Dragon Nicol Bolas. Note that this happens well before Time Spiral and the Mending, so we can assume that Toshi becomes the ancestor of Tetsuo Umezawa, a favorite legend of days past. Also a really badass tiny leader. The mastermind behind the Kami War was Mochi, the Kami of the Crescent Moon, the blue spirit pulling strings behind the scenes, and he's punished for organizing the whole shebang. Yeah, look at this card. This lump is the source of the whole conflict that slaughtered untold numbers. Great job, buddy. That's a gross oversimplification, but I do recommend these novels, so hey, check them out. Let's look at these legends that are so key to the book. Mochi, well, say what you want, but a howling mind on legs isn't quite as threatening as endangering as a nickel bolus. Big bad manipulators at this time just didn't hit that hard. Howling Mind definitely changes games, and players can build decks in a way so as to prepare for that. And that's what Mochi does. If you're looking for a massive rattlesnake scaring away attackers in EDH, you can't go wrong with Michiko Konda. Michiko will let damage happen to you, she just forces opponents to sacrifice permanents for each damage that you take. If you can find a way to protect Michiko, it's going to be very hard to lose to token decks. This doesn't map onto the novel character very well, sadly. Mechanics. There are some new keywords in Saviors of Kamigawa. There's a new ability word, channel. This is on a cycle of common and uncommon creatures that can be channeled, discarding them from your hand as uncounterable effects by paying their mana cost. Ghostlet Stalker forces an opponent to discard two if you activate its creature ability, or it can be channeled for seven mana to force four discards. There are even a few powerful rares with channel, such as Arashi, the Sky Asunder, who can destroy flyers or be channeled to kill all of them at once. Note that channel is an ability on cards in hand, and can only be countered by spells and abilities such as Stifle and Void Slime, not counter spells per se. Channel is a nice way to get more creatures into a set by allowing them to double as spell effects. If you are familiar with Lorwyn's Evoke mechanic, whether the version of the trigger happens when the creature hits play, such as in Muldrifter, or when the creature leaves play, as in Meadow Boom, well then you're looking at a different version of Channel. Evoke can be stopped by counter magic since you're actually playing the spell, whereas Channel can't be stopped by counter spells. The only thing that stops Channel are Stifle type effects, but Evoke lets you get a two for one, while Channel is harder to exploit. Either you discard the card and get the bigger effect, or play the card and get a smaller version on the creature. Evokes the one that I feel should get brought back and reused because the ability is cleaner and easier to anticipate an onboard quantity, whereas Channel is a sneaky ability. And the other thing is that Channel guys all have activated abilities, which require even more processing when they're on the table, so that adds 
more board complexity. And I don't mind board complexity. I tend to do very well as a resource manager. But I understand why this can be very daunting and not helpful for new player acquisition. New World Order is something I don't care for all that much, but I understand why it's good for the game of Magic. The major theme that dominates the common and uncommon run is what designers call wisdom. Cards that cared if you have more cards in your hand than your opponents. This is not a keyworded or ability worded thing. Let's look at Okina Nightwatch. It's five mana for a four three, a bit undersized for green creatures at the time, quite undersized today. But if you have more cards than your opponent in hand, it becomes a hefty seven six. Just to be clear, this is a really strong limited card, first pick worthy. But the thing to keep in mind is that if it lives through combat with three damage on it, and then you play a spell that brings your hand size that turn down to parity, it shrinks down and you lose your night watch. Timing was critical, and in limited matches, players would often ask, how many cards in hand? How many cards in hand? Four, or five, or ten times in the game, or more. Players needed to be sure that they had as many cards in hand as possible in order to exploit these cards, and this pressure led to a lot of inactivity and slow gameplay. In my honest opinion, this constant checking hand state was a pain and drove players crazy, causing a lot of mental processing that again slowed down the game on top of the actual gameplay slowing down. Mark Rosewater likes to call out Lorwyn Blanc for having board complexity that made players' brains hurt, but at least those cards were on the table, whereas Saviors constantly requires you to check hands, which is an entirely different zone. There are only a handful of sweep cards, less than five, so I'm going to save sweep for next time. There's also a rare cycle, the Epic Spells. This ability word is quite remarkable. The spells are powerful and come with an incredible cost. After you play one, you can't cast any other spells, ever, for the rest of the game but you get a free copy of the epic spell on your upkeep. The red one burns things, the white one searches out enchantments and dumps them into play, the blue one lets you steal things from your opponent's deck a la bribery, the green one makes hordes of insects, that's nice, and the black one exiles cards from the opponent's library, presuming that you'll deck them before they can kill you. This cycle was designed to be a way to make spells feel legendary. And I think there's a legit case to be made that they achieve their goal, even if they're overcosted and underpowered. While incredibly cool, the epic spells never made an impact in standard or casual formats. Another rare cycle that introduced a new creature type was the Kibin, a group of flyers that were aggressively costed. Well, okay, except for the green one. Every time you play the Spirit or Arcane spell, you got a cool effect tied into the spell's converted mana cost. They're cool. Except for the green one. I know green pays a tax for flyers, and there's nothing to be done about it. Kirin are celestial spirits, much like dragons, though they're usually much friendlier and less likely to be destructive. Kirin is also the name of a popular Japanese beer. In his Drive to Work podcasts, Mark Rosewater claims that he had no influence in the creation of a cycle of Maros, creatures that count cards in hand to figure out its power and toughness. I'm sorry, Maros. I mean, that's the English pronunciation, but since we're in Kamigawa, I'm saying Maro. Now, I like to take him at his word here, but here, I have a hard time doing it. The green one counts each card twice, which is cool, I suppose. It's the biggest Maro. Kagemaro, first to suffer, is the best of the law and saw a considerable amount of standard play in control decks, since you could sacrifice him with a single black mana to wipe the board of creatures. The green one counts your hand twice. The blue one lets you draw more cards by returning lands to hand, and the red one, Adamaro, cares about the size of your opponent's hand. That's a nice twist. This set also has a rare cycle of flip cards. These creatures start off as mortals, but if the condition is met, they flip to become not spirits, but powerful legendary enchantments. Homura, human ascendant, dies, and then makes your entire army much mightier, giving them plus two, plus two, flying, and fire breathing, making them draconic. When lots of creatures die on the table, Kuon, Ogre Ascendant, becomes the Abyss, forcing each player to sacrifice a creature on their upkeep. Rune Tail, Kitsune Ascendant, makes all your creatures immune to damage once you hit 30 life. Sasaya, Orochi Ascendant, becomes a one-sided super mana flare, doing all sorts of cool things with multiplying lands once you hit seven lands. 
And Erayo Sorotami Ascendant, well, this card is passionately hated in EDH. I don't normally advocate Vigilante Justice, but the ability to counter the first spell each player plays on every turn automatically, ugh. Erayo Ascendant makes games utterly miserable. People in casual circles loathe this card for many good reasons. This card is the fun police. No fun shall happen under its watch. So don't let this guy flip. You can either just kill it or kill the player who has it. There's another cycle of creatures to talk about, the Onna cycle. Onna is Japanese for woman. Now, inspired by the story of the Yuki Onna, the snow woman who lives in the ice of the mountains and ensnares males with its comely looks and ways. The Ona come into play with a relevant effect and can bounce back to their owner's hand with spirit craft. These abilities were critical and very powerful with the ability to put damage on the stack, but with 10th edition's combat rules revamp, the Ona became considerably worse. They were just a bit too expensive to see real turn play. Saviors is a very cycle-heavy set, so we'll save the rest of the discussion of the set for the next video, where I'll talk about the rest of the cards, the most expensive cards, and give a verdict for the set overall, and the block as a whole. So don't miss it. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, hit that like button, hammer on it, well, just get it clicked any way you want, and leave a comment. And please be sure to tell people about this video, share it if you like, because I think more people should know the coolness that is in magic's history. So next time we'll get down to the real nasty critical stuff. This is Eli Kaplan for Ancestral Recall signing off. Good games and good luck.